In Texas, an unsuspecting federal agent is abducted at gunpoint. The men responsible escape unseen into the vast South Texas terrain. Valuable minutes pass before the lawman's disappearance is discovered. With the life of one of their own in jeopardy, his colleagues are determined. They will find the suspects, bring them in, and make them pay. victim of a violent crime is a member of law enforcement, the job of investigating becomes personal. At a United States border crossing, armed fugitives kidnapped a customs inspector, then vanished. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Desperate to find their colleague, local, state, and federal authorities waged a full-scale manhunt in Texas and in Mexico. Racing against the clock, they hoped their resolve would make the difference. Authorities at the U.S. port of entry at Del Rio, Texas, see hundreds of legal crossings between the United States and Mexico every day. But they also see an average of $250 million in confiscated drugs all manner of criminal activities, and thousands of illegal immigrants every year. The men and women of U.S. Customs know the threat of danger is always present. Hiding behind the throng of harmless civilians are criminals who view them as the enemy. On the afternoon of January 27, 1984, a vehicle with Texas plates pulled up to the port's primary checkpoint. Customs inspector Jose Torres asked the occupants for identification. The three passengers provided green cards showing they were legal resident aliens allowed to work in the U.S. The driver explained he was an American citizen, but produced only a baptismal certificate as proof. Inspector Torres could not accept it. Logging in the car's license plate, he ordered the driver to a secondary checkpoint for further verification. The vehicle was met by customs inspector Richard Latham. Hello, man. Baptismal certificate? A 10 year veteran at the border. It was his job to handle questionable persons or vehicles. Oh, me. Latham brought the driver inside to speak with an officer of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. The INS officer chastised the driver over his insufficient papers. Since the man claimed he was a US citizen, born and raised in El Paso, the officer interrogated him on details only a resident could know. In minutes, the man's detailed answers persuaded the official that his lack of paperwork was his only indiscretion. The driver was cleared, but Latham still had to inspect the vehicle. Stand over there. To look inside your car. Following routine procedure, he checked for illegal drugs or undeclared contraband. 
since there was nothing suspicious about the men or their behavior. Inspector Latham was alone during the search. To everyone working at the port that day, it seemed like every other day. Then, at about 4.45 in the afternoon, a detective with the Del Rio, Texas police arrived. He informed border officials that a jewelry store had been robbed 15 minutes earlier in the Mexican border town of Ciudad Acuna, two miles away. His information was unfortunately sketchy, but he said Mexican police were searching for four Hispanic males, at least one of whom could speak English. The police and border officials went immediately to alert each of the inspectors on duty. Since the robbers might try to enter the United States, inspections at the primary checkpoints were doubled. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Where are you heading? Customs officials wanted to be certain that no one connected to the robbery would enter the country. Yes, Got anything to declare? Okay. But at around 5 o'clock, uh, Inspector Torres received disturbing news. Customs Inspector Richard Latham was missing. Del Rio Detective John Martin was at the port that day. For him to just suddenly disappear, we knew something was wrong. Although the time of the disappearance marked a shift change, Latham had not followed the required protocol for leaving his post. He had not left in his own vehicle. He had not checked out and told anyone else that he was leaving. And the standard procedure for those inspectors, even if they were rotating off for a uh, coffee break or to go to the restroom, would have been to have notified uh, other inspectors at the port. None of this had occurred. Their only conclusion was Inspector Latham had been kidnapped. Our first investigative response was to determine when Inspector Latham had last been seen and what he had been doing. Customs Inspector Torres reported seeing Latham searching an older model vehicle at the secondary checkpoint. He described the car as a gray, late 1970s Pontiac Grand Prix with three or four Hispanic males standing alongside who matched the jewelry thieves wanted by Mexican police. The inspector described the driver as a male in his 20s wearing an El Paso baseball cap. Torres realized that as he turned to check the next vehicle, Inspector Latham must have discovered something and the kidnappers struck, then escaped the port unseen. U.S. Customs Service Special Agent Dennis Harlan helped lead the search for Latham. It was a race against time. It's been my experience that if an officer is taken at gunpoint, he is eventually killed. Everyone knew the window of opportunity to rescue the kidnapped officer was short. They sprang into action. A customs officer retrieved the computer list of all license plates that passed through the Del Rio port into the U.S. between 4.15 and 5 p.m., about the time Latham disappeared. The list was less than 100 vehicles, but it did not contain the owner's names and addresses. For that information, they had to access the Department of Motor Vehicles database. Hindered by 1980s computer technology, it would take valuable time to accomplish. Del Rio police began creating a composite likeness using an identikit. Based on Inspector Torres and other witnesses' recollections, pre-drawn facial features merged piece by piece into an image of the driver. When the composite image was complete, Investigators sent it to every local, state, and federal police agency in the area. Police units fanned out in search of a gray Grand Prix. Investigators now had a possible likeness of the driver, but nothing specific on the passengers. Custom Service helicopters supported the ground units in the search. But with few leads, they knew finding the men in the Texas backcountry would be difficult. 
One and a half hours had lapsed since Latham disappeared. A car traveling at an inconspicuous 55 miles per hour could be anywhere within 20,000 square miles. The search area was enormous. And with each minute, it got even larger. In record time, the DMV database returned the list of license plate numbers with the owner's names and addresses. There were eight Pontiac Grand Prix on the list. Police officers went to the six addresses in Del Rio to investigate the vehicles. But two were registered to owners in El Paso, where the driver of the suspect vehicle said he lived, and that was 10 hours away. A customs agent contacted the nearest FBI field office to seek their help and informed Special Agent Don Weatherman about the kidnapping. It was very discouraging to realize that we had a missing customs inspector no trace of where he might be, what happened to him, um, and so very little information other than the fact that he was last seen doing his job and uh, no one knew or seen anything of him uh, since that time. The customs agent asked Weatherman to direct the field agent in El Paso to track down the two registered Grand Prix. FBI Special Agent Charles Riley was assigned to interview the owners of the cars. But at both residences, the vehicles were missing, and no one was home. Agent Riley theorized that the registration information he received may have been outdated. He returned to the El Paso FBI office determined to find the cars and their owners. That evening, I had the, uh, the clerk in the office conduct further license checks on the two vehicle uh, license plates, trying to come up with the actual owners of the vehicles at the current time. It would take hours to cross-reference the data. Much of it would be done by hand. State and local police manned roadblocks in every direction from the port. What do you want? You got any ID? All vehicles leaving the area were stopped and searched. When the San Antonio FBI agents arrived in Del Rio, they were briefed on the latest developments of the search. Despite the efforts of dozens of cooperating law enforcement agencies, they had come up with nothing. Nearly seven hours had passed since Inspector Richard Latham was abducted. By the end of the first night's investigation, there were still no promising leads. You always hope that they'll turn them loose. But History doesn't, doesn't prove that out. Um, so basically, we knew we were looking for a body after probably late that evening, you know. The full-scale search was still ongoing the next morning. Fixed-wing aircraft, which could travel faster and farther than helicopters, widened the search perimeter to cover the vast Texas brush. Texas state troopers continued their roadblocks in the area surrounding Del Rio. Oh, how you doing today, man? Where you headed? Although by that time, they knew the suspects were likely gone. In El Paso, Special Agent Riley eliminated as suspects an elderly couple who owned a gray Pontiac Grand Prix. But the other owner sold his vehicle to a man by the name of Ricardo Cortez. Cortez had failed to register the vehicle in his name. A background check showed Ricardo Cortez had a criminal record for drug possession. Riley located his most current address. I went to that address, spoke with Cortez's mother, 
and determined that he had been out of town for three or four days. She was not sure when he was going to be back. She stated that uh, Cortez still owned the car in question and had the car with him. I went to the El Paso Police Department and obtained a photograph of Cortez and wired a copy to the, uh, the port of entry in Del Rio, Texas. Cortez looked similar to the composite of the driver. Finally, agents had their first suspect, something specific they could move on in hopes of finding Richard Latham and the men who abducted him. But as their hopes rose, 50 miles away, a man collecting firewood near Eagle Pass, Texas, made a grisly discovery. The body of a man wearing a U.S. customs uniform. Come on, step over here, please. In Del Rio, Texas, authorities believe jewelry thieves crossing the border in a gray Pontiac Grand Prix abducted U.S. Customs Inspector Richard Latham. Investigators identified the driver of the car as Ricardo Cortez, who had been missing since Latham's disappearance. But even as they got that first real lead, they learned the body of a man wearing a U.S. Customs uniform was discovered in a ditch off Highway 277 near Eagle Pass, Texas. Local officers secured the scene but decided nobody would enter until the FBI arrived. While agents at the Del Rio port of entry boarded a helicopter for the 60-mile flight to Eagle Pass, Texas state troopers continued to man roadblocks throughout the area. The kidnappers were now most likely gone, but no one could be certain. Though frustrated, trooper Art Corral, who worked the road from Del Rio to El Paso, was not going to give up the search. We were out there for hours uh, checking cars and on the roadblock, and you know, it seemed like nothing was, we weren't going to get anywhere. That our supervisor advised to go ahead and stay on that road, but break off the roadblock. So, my partner and I decided to stop cars that had three or more uh, Latin males in the car. About that time, we saw this car go by, and there were three people in the car. However unlikely, the men inside might be connected to the abduction. The driver got out and approached the troopers. How you doing, sir? How you been? Corral explained why he had pulled him over. Four mil Hispanic subjects are involved in kidnapping. The driver gave his ID. He was a taxi driver from Eagle Pass, hired by the men in his car to take them to Presidio, Texas. He admitted he was glad to be pulled over. His passengers were agitated and made him nervous. They want me to take them from Encinal to Eagle Pass. The trooper decided to run a check on them. How you doing, guys? Give us your IDs, please. He got the green cards of the two passengers, Rafael Calderon and Jesus Ramirez. Neither of them fit the description of the suspect driver of the Grand Prix, and there were only two of them. Determined to be thorough, Trooper Corral and his partner would run a check on the names just in case. Inside the car, Corral's partner tried to the radio GPS dispatch. Unit? Any other station out there can hear me? You can copy me. Please answer. But there was no signal. He tried again. Still, nothing. It's common GPS around unit? that area to lose contact. You had a lot of valleys and peaks, and sometimes you would lose contact with the with the radio station. You'd have to move location in order to make contact with one of our stations. 
He took down the passenger's information to call in from a different position. How much pay you? Couldn't get through, just for the reason. Tell you what, sir. Here's your ID card. Follow me back to the vehicle, okay? They believed they could afford the risk of letting the car go. Out here, there's only one road. You may not have another road for 100 miles. So when you let a car go, you know, for whatever reason, and you uh, and something comes up, you probably have a good chance of finding them again. The troopers took the chance and doubled back to catch a radio signal. By 2.15, FBI agents arrived in Eagle Pass to process the scene where the body was discovered. Everyone working the case had hoped they would find their fellow lawman alive. But the evidence was clear. It was Richard Latham. The inspector had been bound by his own handcuffs and shot twice in the back. The kidnappers were now cop killers. U.S. Customs Agent Dennis Harlan was distraught over the loss of his friend. Yeah, we lost one of ours. When a brother officer has been taken and murdered, and uh, uh, those of us that have been in the field, we take that personally. And I was sorry that Richard was dead, but in a criminal investigation of this nature, finding of the body is very, very important. The body becomes evidence. So I felt a sense of relief that we had found the body sense of sadness that uh, a friend of mine was gone. Examiners would determine he had been shot with a 38 caliber handgun, the same as his service weapon, which was missing. For Del Rio detective John Martin, the execution style murder shed a chilling light on the type of criminal they were after. Someone that has the temerity to kidnap a law enforcement officer and to subsequently murder that officer, knowing the response that you're going to receive. Um, that is the most dangerous type of individual. That means they don't take anyone's life in, in any regard whatsoever, and they would kill the average person on the street in a moment. Troopers kept trying the radio. After several minutes, they made contact. Uh, yeah, go ahead and make it, go ahead. Yes, I need uh, three 29 checks on three subjects. Yeah, uh, Dispatch officers ran checks on the men in the taxi. They came back with a return and said there was a possible hit on one of the passengers, which uh, was Ramirez in the back seat. There was an outstanding DUI warrant for a Jesus Ramirez. It might not be the same Ramirez, but the troopers needed to verify his identity. So we decided to go ahead and, and try to catch up to the car. Fortunately, the taxi was still on the highway. The driver pulled over for a second time. Trooper Corral cleared the driver and approached the vehicle to speak to Jesus Ramirez. I start yelling for the guy in the back seat. Then I need to talk to him to come on out. Uh, at this time, I see uh, I see the passenger kind of slouched in the back seat and he's moving around. You know, I can see his head and shoulders kind of squirming in the back seat. So I keep calling him back, and uh, all of a sudden. On investigating a federal officer's abduction, Texas state troopers pulled a car over to question a man inside. 
But the traffic stop quickly turned dangerous for Trooper Art Corral and his partner. When the shot was fired, my partner reached for the shotgun, and we didn't have time to call anybody. Uh, you know, it was just us two. And when there's a shooting, you got to react quickly, you know, because that, that could mean life or death. Put your hands in the back. Give me the one. With his partner covering him, Corral got Rafael Calderon out of the vehicle and into custody. He placed him behind the squad car, away from any weapons. Get on down, get on down, get on down. Get on down. Then they went to check on the man in the back seat. Jesus Ramirez had shot himself in the head with a 357. The troopers recovered that weapon and a 38 caliber revolver. Now they needed to know why the traffic stop turned deadly. One trooper retrieved Ramirez's identification and a piece of paper from his jacket, while the other removed Rafael Calderon's belongings. Any guns on you? No. All you got? Including a large knife and a cloth bag. Get a card. Corral suspected that Ramirez would not have killed himself over a DUI warrant. He knew there had to be another motive. The troopers called in the incident and learned that Latham's body had been discovered. Customs agent and the FBI believed the highway shooting was connected to the Latham case and flew to the scene. When they arrived, they reviewed the evidence. Along with the 357 Ramirez used to kill himself was a 38 caliber handgun, a service revolver later determined to be Inspector Richard Latham's, the gun that killed him. In the pillowcase taken off Calderon, they discovered tens of thousands of dollars of jewelry that matched the items stolen during the robbery in Mexico. They also found a handwritten bill of sale for a 1975 Pontiac Grand Prix taken from the dead man's jacket. The seller's name was Ricardo Cortez the first suspect identified hours earlier. Now with Rafael Calderon in custody, it was time to get some answers. On the way back to Del Rio, FBI Special Agent Moses Alanez interrogated Calderon. I was in the back seat, a uh, ranger's vehicle. On the way, uh, Mr. Calderon began relating to me what had transpired uh, the previous two days uh, from the point that they left uh, uh, El Paso, uh, himself and, and three other friends, into Mexico. Calderon claimed that Jesus Ramirez planned the robbery. He said Ramirez picked the jewelry store in Mexico, believing it was easier to get away with armed robbery there than in the U.S. While Calderon, Ramirez, and a third man he knew only as Carlos robbed the place, their driver, Ricardo Cortez, waited in the getaway car. They took as much as they could grab in a few minutes. Then left. Calderon said they headed for the border, crossing at Del Rio. Everything seemed fine when Cortez passed the INS interview and the customs inspector searched the trunk.
a look in your car. They began to get nervous when he checked the back seat. He found the bag of stolen jewelry, so Ramirez pulled a gun. They left the port. Cortez and the man named Carlos took the inspector's service revolver and secured him with his own handcuffs. According to Calderon, Jesus Ramirez was in charge the entire time. He decided the inspector had seen too much. They had to get rid of him. Calderon said he and Ramirez forced Latham into the ditch. He claimed it was Ramirez who shot the inspector twice in the back with his own service revolver. After leaving the customs inspector to die, the men continued to Eagle Pass where they crossed the border back into Mexico. At a motel there, they went through the jewelry, putting the most valuable pieces into pillowcases. The plan was then to separate. Calderon and Ramirez would take the jewelry back into the United States. Ricardo Cortez and Carlos were supposed to keep the car in Mexico for a few days. They would all meet later in El Paso. The agent noted that during Calderon's version of events, he repeatedly named Ramirez as the trigger man. As the suspect was taken to jail in Del Rio, agents reviewed the facts of their case. Rafael Calderon was in custody. According to him, the shooter was Jesus Ramirez, who had killed himself at the traffic stop. The driver of the Grand Prix Latham searched was Ricardo Cortez of El Paso. The fourth suspect was a man Calderon knew only as Carlos. He and Ricardo Cortez were still at large. Customs Special Agent Dennis Harlan was determined to find them. Every effort was going to be made to uh, capture and prosecute the people that were involved. After the abduction and murder of U.S. Customs Inspector Richard Latham, investigators developed four suspects. One suspect, Rafael Calderon, was in jail. Another was dead and two more were still at large. Six hours after Latham's body was recovered, the state police in Piedras Negras, Mexico, asked FBI agents to come to their office. Some of the customs inspector's personal effects had been discovered in a parking lot across the border from Eagle Pass, where his body was found. Included were Latham's wallet. A police issued canister of mace. And several documents of interest to FBI Special Agent Don Weatherman. We also located two California Highway Patrol traffic citations. One listed to Raphael Calderon, the subject in custody. And the other listed to Carlos Pena. Less than 24 hours after the abduction, investigators had an ID on the fourth suspect. Carlos Pena was a Mexican native legally residing in the US. Investigators received his photo from the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Now they had to find Pena and his associate, Ricardo Cortez. It seemed that wouldn't take long. The next day, El Paso police received a tip that Cortez and Pena were hiding in an apartment in South El Paso. 
In minutes, an arrest plan was underway. The two block area surrounding the apartment building was locked down. Coordinating units on the ground and in the air was FBI Special Agent Charles Riley. The streets were cordoned off in that area and roadblocks were set up. U.S. Border Patrol helicopters were in the air looking on the rooftops and officers were, were posted throughout the area while the, the search was conducted. The search for the fugitives was a sensitive mission. SWAT teams cleared the building apartment by apartment. It was dangerous work. The hallways were narrow and provided no cover if the two desperate men were to attack. Despite the thorough search, they came up empty. U.S. Customs Agent Dennis Harlan was undaunted. You can throw tons of manpower at a case like this, but you need some luck. And good luck is brought about by good, hard, aggressive police work. Then a new lead came when state police in Piedras Negras, Mexico, discovered a gray 1975 Pontiac Grand Prix abandoned in a nightclub parking lot. FBI agents crossed the border to search the car. But Mexican law prohibited a full-scale processing of the vehicle. We could not remove the vehicle and bring it back to the United States. We couldn't remove anything uh, except prints from the vehicle. The FBI agents photographed the car to document the items they could not collect and dusted for any latent prints. It was a surprisingly low-tech process, scotch tape and index cards. But it paid off. When the fingerprints were sent to the FBI lab in Washington. We determined that all four suspects that were identified had matching prints lifted from the vehicle. In El Paso, Texas, U.S. Customs agents continued their search for Ricardo Cortez and Carlos Pena. Six years. Six years. They learned Pena and the now dead suspect Jesus Ramirez had lived in the same apartment complex. They interviewed the apartment manager who identified the photo of Pena. She said she last saw him and Ramirez on the night before the Latham murder. The two were moving boxes from a gray Grand Prix into an apartment. A third man arrived, driving a blue car. From the agent's other photos, she identified him as Ricardo Cortez. She said the three men drove away that night in the Grand Prix, leaving the blue car in the lot. The manager got a call from Ricardo Cortez the next day, asking her not to tow the car. Either he or his mechanic would pick it up soon. That blue car was their best chance of getting to Cortez. Through the night and into the morning, agents maintained surveillance. Around noon, a man came and drove the car away. It was not Cortez or Pena. The agents followed. The man drove to a quiet part of town. He entered a bar. A few minutes later, he came back out alone and was stopped by the agents. 
Ask a few questions. Sure. The man admitted the car belonged to Ricardo Cortez. He said Cortez asked him to pick it up and meet him at the bar. But Cortez never showed, so he left the keys with the bartender. He said he didn't know where Cortez was staying. The agents verified his story with the bartender. He'd not seen Cortez either. While surveillance continued on the blue car, FBI agents located Cortez's girlfriend. What's going on? What's this all about? We think your daughter's boyfriend They asked if she knew where Cortez was. She said that she had not seen or heard from him in over a week. This is very important. But agents, even the woman's own mother, doubted her story. They asked the mother if they could install a tap and trace on her phone. With her consent, investigators could locate the source of all incoming calls. We needed to apprehend the other two suspects involved in the kidnapping of Richard Latham and his subsequent murder. So that's where the focus went from there. I mean, where in the hell are these guys, you know? All investigators could do was wait for Ricardo Cortez to call. The FBI, U.S. Customs Service, and other agencies were closing in on two remaining suspects in the murder of a U.S. Customs officer. Agents had contacted the girlfriend of one of the suspects, Ricardo Cortez, and were monitoring her telephone. Hello? Ricky? Where are you? Two days later, she received a call. Okay. Be careful. It was Cortez. What was he at? He didn't tell her where he was, but agents traced the call to a motel in El Paso. Yes, we traced down the last call that was on this line. Special Agent Charles Riley was ready. Myself, other agents, uh, members of the El Paso Police Department and U.S. Customs proceeded to the motel. A SWAT team surrounded the building. Ricardo, come out of the hotel. Through the combined efforts of three law enforcement agencies, investigators accomplished their mission, according to Special Agent Don Weatherman. The El Paso Office of the FBI Customs and the Police Department there did a very good job Cortez was arrested with that motel. Eight days after Richard Latham's murder, Texas authorities had Ricardo Cortez in custody. A search of the room revealed no sign of suspect Carlos Pena. The driver of the Grand Prix, Ricardo Cortez, and Rafael Calderon were now in custody. Jesus Ramirez had killed himself at the traffic stop, but Carlos Pena was still at large. When questioned about the murder, Cortez gave a different account from that of the first suspect interviewed, Rafael Calderon. Cortez agreed that after they kidnapped Latham, Ramirez and Calderon led the inspector into the ditch. But Cortez said the fatal shots were fired not by Ramirez, but by Rafael Calderon. After the traffic stop by the Texas State Troopers and Ramirez committed suicide, Calderon saw an opportunity to blame his dead associate. When Cortez stated that it was in fact Calderon who had shot Inspector Latham, this was somewhat of a surprise. Cortez said that after the four split up, he and Peña abandoned the car and took a bus to Juarez, Mexico. Cortez advised that 
Pena was still in Juarez and had not uh, come over to El Paso. The FBI realized that they could not arrest him on their own. One of the other agents that I was working with contacted the Mexican authorities and provided them with the background information on Pena, and they started looking for Pena in Juarez. The U.S. Customs Service offered Mexican police a reward in exchange for information leading to Pena's arrest. Police in Juarez made sure Pena's friends and relatives understood that authorities would not leave any of them alone until the fugitive surrendered. Two days later, the tactic proved successful. Pena contacted the El Paso FBI office and advised that he wanted to turn himself in. Arrangements were made with him to meet at the top of the Santa Fe Bridge. Uh, the top of the bridge is the border between Mexico and the United States, and there's a marker there. We are not allowed to proceed into to Mexico for any interviews or any apprehensions. So by meeting him at the top of the bridge, we asked him to step across into the United States, which he did, and we took him into custody. The manhunt was over. The investigators took Carlos Pena to the El Paso port of entry. When questioned, his story matched that of Cortez down to the slightest detail. FBI Special Agent Don Weatherman. In my mind, the arrest of Carlos Pena pretty much summarized and concluded the investigation as to who was responsible for Richard Latham's murder. Their story was so consistent, um, I'm convinced that Calderon was the shooter and not uh, the deceased, Jesse Ramirez. In San Antonio, a federal grand jury indicted Calderon, Cortez, and Pena on six counts. In exchange for his cooperation, Ricardo Cortez was allowed to plead guilty to conspiracy and assault on a federal officer. Carlos Pena pled guilty to the same charges. They were also convicted of state kidnapping charges and each received 23 years. Rafael Calderon, the man who killed Richard Latham, was charged with assault and murder of a federal officer. He pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. No one had been able to stop the men from taking U.S. Customs Inspector Richard Latham's life. But his peers, his friends, made sure the killers paid the price. Customs Service Special Agent Dennis Harlan. When anybody is murdered, it's serious business. But when an officer serves the country and protects the people, when he's he or she is murdered, there's, uh, there's something that happens within law enforcement that's very, very positive. Nobody cares about who gets credit. Everybody is interested in capturing those who were involved and seeing that justice is done. Memorial services for Richard Latham were held at the Del Rio port of entry on January 31st, 1984 at 2 p.m. At 2.30, U.S. Customs officers in every port of entry in the country observed a moment of silence out of deep respect for their fallen friend. The nation's railroads become the conduit of a killer. He strikes at random, then disappears. Recurring clues tell police they face the worst predator of all, a ritual serial killer. He's cunning, deadly, and on the move. But the authorities are determined to stop him in his tracks.
More than 200,000 miles of train track cross the United States. From California to Kentucky, few living near a railroad felt safe in the summer of 1999. A serial killer rode the rails, picking towns and victims at random. He left behind a trail of bloodshed, but no trace of where he would turn up next. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the number of victims grew, the FBI enlisted the help of a profiler to help predict the killer's next move. On December 17, 1998, in West University Place, Texas, a young woman called the police from outside the house of a friend she worked with. She was worried about her. She told them that her friend, a prominent doctor at a nearby medical school, had failed to show up at work that morning. We'll be on arriving on the scene. Look, here they are. According to her colleague, this was completely out of character. She had not responded to phone calls to the house all day, nor had she answered her door. When we hung up, everything was fine. She said she'd see me tomorrow. And nothing out of the ordinary. And that, that was yesterday. The colleague was sure that something was wrong. The doors and windows of the house were locked. From the outside, everything seemed normal. The officers found that the garage door was unlocked. And inside, the door to the house, wide open. Jewelry on the floor suggested a robbery. The house had been ransacked. The officers moved cautiously. An intruder could still be inside. The downstairs was clear. But a trail of clothes led to the second floor. In the master bedroom, they found the doctor. She had been brutally murdered. 222, let me have a supervisor in a crime scene unit to the scene. Detective Kenneth Maha responded to the scene. Though a 10-year veteran of the department, he was surprised by the report of a homicide. West University Place, just a small little suburb, 2.2 square miles, right in the middle of Houston, largely residential and uh, an affluent community. And the last time we had a murder was in 1985 during a robbery of a pharmacy. The brutality of the crime struck the detective. Blood spatter was all over the place, in the hallway, and on the, the walls and the door. Uh, the body was completely covered except for uh, one arm sticking out and, uh, and her two legs. There was a large butcher knife that was near the body, laying on a pillow. Oh. Investigators also recovered a heavy, blood-spattered, blunt object nearby. Both were weapons of opportunity the killer found in the house.
Police contacted the doctor's husband and learned he had taken the couple's two children out of town to visit relatives before Christmas. They'd been gone for several days. The victim had work obligations to take care of that wife, so she was not able to travel with him. Take a look at this over here. Evidence suggested that the killer had taken his time in the house. He tore open Christmas gifts and rummaged through the victim's belongings. The contents of her purse were spilled out and her driver's license was clearly left out and displayed. It was, uh, it was quite strange to see it like that. In the kitchen, the detective found partially eaten fruit. Possibly more evidence the killer had lingered in the house. He also found the keys to the victim's Jeep. According to the doctor's husband, it was the only set. In the garage, there were no foreign fingerprints at the suspected point of entry. But on a workbench, investigators found the broken cover of a steering column next to some pry tools. The killer must have stolen the victim's Jeep. We surmise then that he had to break the steering column of the Jeep uh, to actually crank it up and to start it. Here, the murderer made a crucial mistake. When I picked up the large piece of the steering column, I could visibly see fingerprints on the shiny black plastic. The column cover was bagged for later analysis at the lab. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined cause of death. Multiple stab wounds and blunt force trauma to the head. The victim had been sexually assaulted. The gruesome nature of the murder worried Detective Maha. It just didn't fit the pattern of a, a random killing. It was a step beyond. Investigators knew that killers like this usually don't strike only once. Two days later and 200 miles away, San Antonio police found an abandoned Jeep in a motel parking lot. The plates were traced to West University Place. It belonged to the doctor. The plastic cover of the steering column was missing. Inside, investigators found a guitar and a meat cleaver. The doctor's husband had noted that both items were missing from the house. Someone had hotwired the Jeep in a hurry. We noticed, too, that the uh, steering column was just an absolute uh, disarray. The Jeep was fingerprinted inside and out, but technicians found no usable prints. At the police department's forensics lab, analysts made electronic copies of the fingerprints lifted from the Jeep's steering column cover and ran them through an automated matching system. And at that time, we got a positive match on an individual named uh, Carlos Rodriguez. A computer check revealed another name, Rafael Resendez Ramirez. This was forwarded to the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services Division. A search of their extensive database revealed dozens of other aliases and more information on Resendez. He had an extensive record going back more than 20 years and an active warrant on a stolen vehicle charge. Investigators reviewed the suspect's file from the Immigration and Naturalization Service and learned Resendez traveled regularly and illegally between the United States and Mexico. 
Most recently, he had been arrested in California for trespassing on railroad property with a loaded firearm and was deported to Mexico. Now it appeared that Rafael Resendez was back in Texas. His transient lifestyle would make him difficult to find. Detective Maha searched the suspect's records for a place to start and found the name of the fugitive's sister. She lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In a prearranged phone conference, Maha spoke with her at the Albuquerque Police Department. Yeah. Be able to get some things, uh, some information about your brother, if that'd be all right. She wasn't able to tell me a whole lot about uh, current activity of her brother. Uh, she did not have much contact with him. She did mention that he would sometimes uh, drift through Albuquerque, stay with her for a few days, and then just uh, disappear. Detective Maha asked her to call if she heard from her brother. And I think there was a little bit of anger and resentment on her part at uh, being, having to be involved with it. She really didn't want to be associated with him if indeed he was uh, a real killer as, uh, as we thought that he was. Authorities also asked the public for help. They distributed wanted posters along the train routes Resendez was known to use. Dozens of tips turned up nothing. In March, three months after the doctor's murder, there was a series of reported hey. sightings in rail yards near San Antonio. Resendez had traveled 200 miles west. Each time, he fled before police could respond. The suspected killer was still on the move, hopping trains and eluding authorities. With thousands of miles of train tracks to choose from, Rafael Resendez could be anywhere. Five months after the doctor's murder, and only 90 miles away in Weimar, Texas, members of a local church went to check on their pastor. He and his Pastor. wife had not been at church that morning. Doors wide open. Pastor! 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 The couple was found, murdered in their own bed. Weimar's a small town. Murder is nearly unheard of. Texas Rangers and the Fort Bend County Sheriff's Office arrived at the scene. The preacher and his wife had been bludgeoned to death with a sledgehammer, a weapon of opportunity taken from their garage. The coroner set time of death at 24 to 36 hours earlier. The couple had been murdered late Friday or early Saturday morning. Money and valuables lay in plain sight. Robbery was clearly not the motive. Deputies processed the bedroom with luminol, a chemical that reacts to the protein in blood and other bodily fluids. It revealed the victim's blood and bodily fluid from an unknown source. Forensic testing later revealed the woman had been sexually assaulted. It appeared that after the murders, the killer had lingered at the crime scene. He ate in the victim's kitchen and took his time studying their driver's licenses. The investigators at the scene were unaware of the West University Place murder but not for long. In May 1999, Texas authorities were on the trail of a fugitive, Rafael Resendez. Fingerprints implicated him in the murder of a doctor in West University Place. Four months later, 
A preacher and his wife were found beaten to death in their home in Weimar. The couple's red pickup truck was missing, probably stolen by the killer. Police put out an APB for the vehicle. At the Department of Public Safety, investigators from the Texas Rangers were troubled by the crime scene. The evidence in the house, partially eaten food and displayed ID cards, suggested a ritualistic killer. The Rangers contacted the FBI's Houston field office to get the opinion of a criminal profiler, Special Agent Mark Young. You have in a crime scene a lot of messages, a lot of forensic uh, evidence, and a lot of behavioral evidence. You can pick up not only the forensics, the fingerprints, the DNA, the hairs and fibers, and those types of things, but you can also get a, a look into the offender's behavior. The way he commits that crime is unique. It's different than any other offender. Young noted that this killer acted with extreme rage, but no sign of panic. What really struck me behaviorally was this offender, uh, unlike a lot of others, spent an incredible amount of time in that house going through everything. Their wallet and, and purse, respectively, were opened up, and their identification was showing. In other words, the offender sat there and looked at their photographs did not taking any credit cards, not taking any cash. Profilers can analyze a killer's behavioral choices in an attempt to reveal details about him. In this case, after killing the victims, the perpetrator kept striking with his weapon. But then he covered their bodies. This suggested perhaps even he was repelled by the results of his actions. Displaying the victim's ID cards might be an act of domination, as if he wanted details about the lives he had taken. One of the Texas Rangers Young spoke to had seen something like this before. He realized, because he had some knowledge of the case in West University, that some of the same types of things had happened. And he said, hey, guys, uh, you know, could this be connected? Not only are we looking at some MO that, that seems similar, but we're looking at behavior uh, this uh, ritualistic behavior, or what we call sometimes signature, uh, of an offender. If there was a connection between the two cases, the forensics lab would find it. One of the advantages we had is that we had forensic evidence in both places. We had uh, fingerprints and DNA evidence in the West University case. We also had DNA evidence at uh, the Weimar location. DNA analysis revealed that the bodily fluid recovered in both cases matched. The same man sexually assaulted both women. Since the first victim's Jeep had been recovered, investigators wondered how the killer got to the second crime scene. In both cases, a vehicle had been stolen after the crime. That would have meant, uh, traditionally, that uh, somebody had to bring the person there or that they were somebody from close by. Young studied the case file of suspect Rafael Resendez. There was information already in that fugitive investigation indicating that Resendez got around by train. According to the file, there were train tracks 50 yards from the doctor's house in West University Place. We turned around and looked. There's a train track immediately across the street from the Weimar location. With the two cases directly connected, investigators believed Rafael Resendez was a ritual serial killer. And the manner that he did these crimes is somewhat evolutionary. Uh, you don't just wake up one day and and boom, get involved in that type of crime. It's something that you've uh, practiced, you've built up to, uh, and you've done before. And he's not going to stop uh, all of a sudden either. They feared Resendez was using stolen vehicles and the railroads to find his next victim.
At the Houston field office, the FBI's fugitive squad joined the hunt for Resendez. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd led the investigation. We knew that he had fled the jurisdiction and had most likely traveled interstate and, in fact, into Mexico. Because Resendez had likely left Texas, they obtained an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant. It would allow the FBI to add its federal resources to the hunt. The first thing that we wanted to do is to find out everything that we possibly could about Resendez. We knew that he had been arrested over 13 times. I immediately started getting all the prison record pen packets so that I could identify not only relatives but associates, determine his patterns. All the interviews revealed to us that this was a man who was not well known by anybody. His family had not really had a lot of contact with him since he left home at 12 years of age and moved to Acapulco and eventually to Florida. With little to go on, criminal profiler Mark Young tried to unlock the drifter's past to predict his next move. He forwarded details of both cases to analysts at the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. VICAP analysts use sophisticated databases to identify similar unsolved cases. Immediately, uh, they were able to return to me a case in Lexington, Kentucky. A Hispanic male had assaulted uh, a college student uh, and murdered uh, her boyfriend. This happened uh, late at night in 1997 near the railroad tracks where these two had been walking. The male was killed by his skull being crushed by a rock and the female was sexually assaulted. Uh, she was also physically assaulted pretty severe injuries. Though dazed by the attack, the young woman somehow survived. Seeing that her boyfriend was dead, she made her way to a nearby house where residents called the police. She was able to give them an artist depiction, uh, a local artist, of uh, the offender. Young received the sketch from the Lexington Police Department. I compared it, and I didn't immediately say, wow, you know, this is him. What I felt was kind of an guarded optimism that this could be the same guy. But a sketch isn't proof. Young needed scientific evidence to be sure. He learned that the Lexington police still had DNA samples from the sexual assault two years earlier and arranged for the samples to be flown to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. At the DNA analysis unit, examiners began processing the samples. Examiner Alan Giusti. We look at 13 different unique DNA regions and we develop an individual profile at each one of those regions. I describe it like looking at a person's physical characteristics. You can look at one DNA region and it might be the same as another person's. And that'd be like saying that two people both have brown eyes. Well, that's very common. You look at 13 different DNA regions, it's like saying somebody has brown eyes, is left-handed, is six foot three, is got red hair. The more DNA regions you look at, the more complete the picture you get of the person. After mapping the DNA profile of the perpetrator from Lexington, Juicy contacted the examiners in Texas who had mapped the samples from Weimar and West University Place. By comparing the results uh, that I obtained with the results they obtained, uh, we were both able to determine that we had a possible common donor. In other words, the same person was committing these crimes. In Texas, Young forwarded the news to the other investigators. I was able to call Lexington PD, and I heard a lot of hooping and hollering because they thought it was going to be an unsolved case. Lexington police now had Rafael Resendez as their prime suspect. Authorities across the Southwest canvassed homeless shelters and train yards. They knew Resendez was out there somewhere. On May 28th, 
Authorities found the preacher's truck abandoned near a train yard in San Antonio. It looked like Resendez had returned to the rails. Finding him would be an overwhelming task for Special Agent Eckert and her team. We had never faced this type of obstacle before. There are thousands of tracks, there are thousands of trains every day. And it was difficult to determine which line that he rode. With a massive search area to cover, they had to be resourceful. One way we handled this is we developed a small wanted poster that we gave to the people that frequently rode the railroads. In train yards across the nation, locals were advised to be on the lookout for Rafael Resendez. If they spotted him, they should call the FBI fugitive squad immediately. When we received these calls, we would contact the railroad police. They would pull the person off the train and identify them. Agents and railroad police responded to hundreds of sightings. Each time, it wasn't rescinded. The FBI's best lead was the fugitive sister in New Mexico. Agents stayed in contact with her, hoping she might hear from him. And if she did hear from him, they hoped she'd talk. So far, it seemed the only way to track Resendez was to follow a trail of bodies. On June 4th, 1999, a Fayette County, Texas woman stopped by her mother's house to check on her. The 73-year-old widow lived alone. The house had been ransacked. Mom? There was no sign of her mother. Mom? As she searched each room, her panic rose. Mom? Then, in the bedroom, she found her mother's body. The elderly woman had been bludgeoned to death. In 1999, agents were on the trail of Rafael Resendez, linked to four murders in Texas and Kentucky. As his notoriety grew, the press dubbed him the Railroad Killer. Now, an elderly widow had been murdered in rural Fayette County, Texas. Like the other victims, she lived near a railroad. The gruesome crime looked like the work of Rafael Resendez, according to FBI Special Agent Mark Young. When you looked at that real brutal style of murder, you felt like, yeah, I'd okay, be dealing with the same guy because she was covered similarly. There were uh, jewelry boxes that had been opened up in other rooms. Things had been opened and gone through, and there were items taken. It was a familiar and disturbing pattern. Cash and jewelry had been left behind. Instead, the killer stole trinkets and personal items, as if taking souvenirs. Fingerprints in the laundry room indicated the killer had broken in through a rear window. The print was later matched to Resendez. After slaying his victim, he was in no rush to leave. Not only did he go around to all of the rooms, take certain items, and spend an inordinate amount of time, uh, he went and had some fruit and uh, some bread which was a thing that we had seen a, a number of times. I take that to be more of a signature, showing that I totally own and dominate this individual and their belongings, more than a, I'm hungry and I need something to eat. Two distinctive clues at the Fayette County scene seemed intended as a message to investigators. 
a newspaper had been placed on the sofa, open to an article about the recovery of the preacher's stolen vehicle. In a guest bedroom, they found a toy train. It had been recently unpacked and set up on the bed. It seemed the railroad killer was taunting the authorities. A canine unit followed his scent to the train tracks. From there, the trail went cold. Less than 24 hours later, the next victim was discovered. Another gruesome murder near railroad tracks. This one 95 miles from Fayette County. I got a call in regard to a crime scene in Houston that was being assessed by the Houston Police Department. Uh, they were noticing some similarities. A 26-year-old school teacher was found sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death in her bedroom. Her driver's license had been removed from her wallet and displayed on a table. Like the other victims, she lived near railroad tracks. The teacher's car, a white Honda sedan, had been stolen. Later DNA analysis confirmed Resendez had assaulted the woman. Now he was killing at a much faster pace. One of the concerns we did have was that this guy was going to evolve into what we call a spree killer. Uh, a lot of times in the past, we've had serial killers, uh, Ted Bundy, uh, for instance, uh, that the pressure got so great uh, that they went into a spree mode. And that is, they began to kill a number of victims with really no cooling off period. With his last two victims killed in a 24-hour period, it appeared Resendez had made the shift to spree killer. 2014, three-step protection on the conductor. Step in there, air and brake, go out. On June 6th, a rail yard worker spotted the fugitive in Flatonia, Texas, halfway between Houston and San Antonio. 2014, we have a trespass on premises. Call Central Dispatch, right in Westbound. He immediately and notified local police and the FBI. Once again, Resendez slipped, slipped away. Okay, guys, we've got some additional information. At the Houston FBI field office, Operation Train Stop was created. Now investigators from more than 30 Guys, agencies were assigned exclusively to the case. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd was part of the operation that was comprised of two basic squads. You had the one squad that was the serial homicide investigators that were looking into the various homicides, developing evidence of crimes. Then the other side was the fugitive investigators that their sole purpose was to locate, apprehend, and arrest. The fugitive squad looked for patterns in the suspect's past. We were able to determine that he followed the crops um, throughout the United States. In Washington state, he followed the avocado route. In Florida, he would be involved in the citrus crops. In Kentucky and North Carolina, he would pick tobacco. After identifying farm work sites and addresses of friends and family, agents would try to eliminate these comfort zones. And you go everywhere that you can possibly think of that the fugitive might show up. By going there, by law enforcement presence in those places, people aren't willing to help out the fugitive anymore. But this fugitive was comfortable traveling fast and on his own without any help. And his murder spree was not yet over. Eight days after the school teacher was killed in Houston, her car was found 300 miles away near the Mexican border. Inside was a knife, but no sign of where Resendez had gone. 
Nearby were train tracks, giving the killer a clean escape to almost anywhere. In 1999, more than 30 law enforcement agencies hunted for Rafael Resendez, known as the Railroad Killer. Whenever a new crime appeared to be the work of the killer, Special Agent Mark Young investigated. I was getting hundreds of calls from departments around the country wanting me to uh, listen to their stories about their crimes and, and determine whether uh, the cases might be linked. On June 15th, the bodies of a 51-year-old woman and her father were discovered in their home in rural Gorham, Illinois. The local sheriff's office believed Resendez was involved and called Mark Young. As soon as we walked onto the scene, we could have been in one of our crime scenes in Texas. The double rail tracks were right behind uh, the older man's residence. The killer broke in through a back window. He used a weapon of opportunity, a shotgun he found in the home. He stole a few trinkets and ate the victim's food. But this time, the killer had added something new, a statement scrawled on the wall. A lot of people thought, oh, God, we got some other type of offender here uh, that's making a political statement. But Young knew better. He had reviewed the fugitive's prison file, including his correspondence. He had been writing political messages and letters that we were able to view in the past. That was even further indication to me that this is the same offender because this now is the rest of his fantasy coming out. In his own mind, Resendez was a deep political thinker. But authorities knew he was a vicious predator. He was tied up in his chair. She was straight across the off the table. They believed he got to Gorham on the train and left in the victim's car, which was recovered the next day, 60 miles south near the Kentucky border. Police across the country checked cold cases looking for murders Resendez might have committed. Special Agent Young investigated one in Hughes Springs, Texas. In October of 1998, a woman had been beaten to death with an antique flat iron. Though unsolved, the murder had been thoroughly investigated and documented. And I felt like there was a good possibility that Resendez was responsible for that case, too. We had blunt force trauma. Uh, she was an elderly victim. She was not uh, sexually assaulted. But she was covered in a similar fashion. And in looking at his crime scene photography, I see where uh, her identification had been placed up as if the offender looked at it. Because it happened in all. Because the spree killer could be anywhere, the FBI placed Rafael Resendez on their 10 most wanted fugitives list. His mug shots were posted with 30 different aliases. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd hoped it might shake new leads free. What this does is it raises the awareness of the case, the fugitive status, and it also allowed for us to offer up to $50,000 for the successful apprehension of Resendez. News of the Resendez case swept through the country. On heightened alert, agents and police searched hundreds of freight trains and train yards. It was as if Resendez had disappeared. Don Clark, then special agent in charge of the Houston field office, held press conferences to help spread the word. But he was candid about the case's difficulty. It's a very complex investigation. It's one like many of us have never been involved with before. Uh, we are dealing with a lot of unknowns here. We're dealing with a lot of pieces of information, and it's a very difficult investigation for all of the agencies. The story led news broadcasts nationwide. 
And with eight victims now dead, the public was terrified. Eight is more than enough, many more than enough, one is more than enough, and that's all that I can assure the public is that law enforcement is working together to try and get this person out of the street. The fugitive was deceptively smart and incredibly dangerous. He could move across the country easily and slip across the border at will. What we were trying to let people know was this is not some railroad hobo or bum uh, that doesn't have any sense traveling around. This is a guy with a good IQ uh, that knew how to evade law enforcement, uh, that we needed a lot of assistance in capturing. This is a guy that was attacking innocent people in their sleep, and there was nobody really safe. The reward for the fugitive's capture climbed to $125,000. Calls came in from all over the country. I'd like to, thank you. In late June, Resendez was spotted at a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky. But he never stayed in one place for long. Before the police could arrive, he was gone. Sergeant Mark Barnard of the Lexington, Kentucky Police Department warned the public. Uh, if I lived near a railroad track, I'd certainly have it well lit. Uh, I'd check and make sure nothing is uh, out of the ordinary. I'd know my environment, my neighbors. I'd check my doors and windows. The tips kept coming. We had 3,178 calls that came into the command post. From those calls, we generated over 1,100 leads. In other words, things that needed to be done throughout the United States and in Mexico. One credible tip was phoned into the Denver field office. The caller reported seeing Resendez at a house in Commerce City, Colorado. After authorities traced a phone call from the house to the Mexico town where Resendez had family, a tactical arrest team responded and moved in for the capture. Seven months into the search for Rafael Resendez, an arrest team raided a house in Commerce City, Colorado. They secured the occupants and searched the house. But Resendez was nowhere to be found. And authorities later determined the tip was a case of mistaken identity. Texas Rangers and the FBI agents kept in contact with the fugitive sister in New Mexico. She assured them that she had not heard from her brother, but promised that if he called, she would contact them. But at the FBI command post in Houston, the next big lead concerned a relative no one knew about before. Agents learned Resendez had a wife in Mexico. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd followed up on the surprising new lead. The command post became aware that he had a common law wife because she was interviewed by Mexican media. And a local station got a copy of that interview and showed it, aired it locally. At that point, we brought his wife to Houston for a two-day interview. Authorities needed to know as much as they could about Resendez, his patterns, and the places he had stayed. And did he write here all the time? She provided us with a lot of information about Resendez and his habits over the last two or three years. She advised that he brought her jewelry, he brought her figurines, sometimes little angel figurines. He brought her a guitar. I knew that a lot of these items had been stolen from crime scenes, and it in fact turned out that these items were linked to the homicides. She said Resendez had been in Mexico very recently, but she hadn't seen him in days. She was cooperating because she feared he wasn't safe there. In Mexico, bounty hunters were after him. Resendez was running out of places to hide. On July 10, 1999, investigators received a phone page from Albuquerque. 
It was the fugitive's sister. Yes, I'm returning your call. She needed to talk to authorities. Okay, we're on our way. According to Special Agent Mark Young. There were relatives in Mexico uh, that were being approached by law enforcement, by uh, bounty hunters, by curiosity seekers. Lopez, thank you for the page. Um, there were people that really didn't care how they got him across. You know, dead or alive, I want the reward money. She said her brother had called her. She did not want him to be harmed. Law enforcement told her that uh, we could affect a safe surrender for him and we would agree to treat him humanely uh, and get him in custody uh, to resolve this thing. On July 12, 1999, Rafael Resendez agreed to turn himself in to a Texas Ranger at a small border crossing. Hands on the head. Respecting his sister's wishes, authorities agreed to let him walk across and to take him in with a minimal arrest team. One of the most vicious serial killers in the nation's history was taken into custody quietly and without incident. In follow-up interviews with Mark Young, Resendez would confess to a total of 13 murders, four of them not yet connected to him by authorities. He could recall in incredible detail crimes that occurred several years before. After discussions with him, I would contact the uh, jurisdictions that had primary uh, control of the investigations that, that he was referring to. And we uh, resolved two homicides in Florida, Marion County, Florida, uh, one in Colton, California, uh, and uh, uh, one homicide in Barrow County, uh, Georgia. You tell me the train. The question in everyone's mind was why. In the interviews, Resendez made the sickening claim that he killed to wipe out evil. Yet among his victims were a doctor, a preacher and his wife, a teacher, and elderly people. Did you murder? All upstanding citizens, well loved by their families. The search for Rafael Resendez took eight months and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. In court, he attempted to use an insanity defense to explain his crimes. But in May of 2000, he was found guilty of first-degree murder. Four days later, Rafael Resendez was sentenced to death. Okay. 